ஹலோ ஹலோ எஸ் ஜானி वी आर हियर वी आर हियर वी आर हियर वी आर बिगिनिंग ओके द द पावर पॉइंट इज स्टिल देयर राइट Uh, I'll just check. Just, just a second. Just a second. Uh, sir, can you share it once more? Uh, the previous, like the previous. Say that again. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, can it, you share your PowerPoint once, uh, once again? Share your screen once more. Like, like we had it previously. Yes, it's coming, John. Yes, sir. You are visible, sir. All right. Okay. A very warm good evening, distinguished dignitaries and participants, and a very beautiful morning to our resource person. My name is Rosemary Jose, fourth semester social work student at Sri Shankaracharya University of Sanskrit Regional Campus, Payanur, and I am the MC for the session. International Conference Epistem 2022 brings together academia, researchers, students, and practitioners. It is my pleasure to welcome you and thank you for joining us. Now I invite Ms. Anushwara to welcome the gathering. A very warm good evening to all. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to the second session of Third International Conference Epistem 2022. by the department of social work sri shankaracharya university of sanskrit kaladi regional center payanur ladies and gentlemen let me welcome our resource person dr johnny agustin professor st ambrose university iowa usa he was the chair of the council on global social issues from 2017 2020 currently he serves as a commissioner at commission on global social work education I take this opportunity to welcome all faculty, scholars, students from other universities to this session. Finally, I welcome each one of you to the session. Lend your ears to the topic: Social, Economic, and Environmental Justice through Radical Social Work: Opportunities and Challenges. by a great resource person dr johnny agasti thank you anashwara now we have come to the core agenda of our session that is thematic presentation on the topic social economic and environmental justice through radical social work opportunities and challenges a discussion that is becoming more and more critical every day this webinar would reflect on such an important human endeavor i'm extremely proud and delighted to say that the topic would be presented by our alumnus dr johnny agustin who currently serves as the professor at st ambrose university in davenport iowa usa after completion of msw from our university dr johnny went to pursue his mphil from national institute of mental health and neurosciences after receiving his phd from university of denver colorado dr johnny joined st ambrose university where he currently teaches courses in social welfare history social policy and empowerment practice dr agastin's current research and advocacy focus on the complex interactions between poverty disaster recovery and social policy with an emphasis on empowerment oriented social work practice he recently co-authored an article with uh, enet cox entitled the us criminal justice system a role for radical social work in the journal of progressive human services She served as the chair of the Council on Global Social Issues at CSWE from 2017 to 2020, and currently is a member of the Commission on Global Social Work Education at CSWE. The moderator for this session is our another proud alumnus, Mr. Anish K, Assistant Professor, Sri Shankaracharya University of Sanskrit, Regional Campus, Thiruvur. He is a doctoral student at Tata Institute of Social Sciences, School of Development Studies in Mumbai. his interest areas including 
development discourses, anti-oppressive practice, and political ecology. And before we begin, a general reminder to all participants regarding the feedback forms, which will be shared through the chat box. Kindly take time to fill it, fill it up so that you can ensure your certificate. Now may I invite Mr. Anish K to moderate the session. Over to you, sir. Hello. Am I audible? Hello? Yes, Anish, you are audible. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your kind words, and I'm glad to have been uh, invited for this webinar. Firstly, uh, I'm I'm also an alumnus of the of the center, and uh, it was um, eight minutes ago. So, can I can I switch off the this one the video? And my there are some something is unfolding here in the, my my house. So I'm sorry for that. Shall I? Hello. Uh, it's okay, Anish. Yeah, we understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, firstly, uh, I'm an I'm an alumnus of the center, and uh, and you know it was during uh, my stint. I also taught the center in for a for a short period of time. Uh, it was during uh, I think 2013 the first edition of Epistemi um, uh, began, and uh, the center has actually carried forward the the, the same, and uh, you know um, uh, and and still continues to deliver a uh, lot of you know uh, engages in a lot of academic discourses and uh, deliberations. So uh, today I will I will say a few words. I think uh, it, it's up to the uh, to to the speaker to you know you know decide on what to what to talk and you know what. So I will just uh, say a few words uh, before the before the lecture. And I think uh, Professor Johnny will deliver the talk on social econo social economic and environmental justice through radical social work opportunities and challenges. And uh, as far well as I know, uh, this lecture will co cover uh, themes like uh, such as poverty. Global inequality, housing, income, healthcare, fascist fascist tendencies, war, and uh, environmental degradation. So, uh, as we all know that uh, you know um, uh, inequality and uh, poverty has a you know has a deadly effect on those who receive, especially those who receive and with various uh, social welfare policies. And uh, and in especially in the in the global south and you know most of the uh, developing countries, the citizens are. Are mainly uh, depending on social welfare policies uh, provided by the, the state governments, and uh, the radical social work recognize this, you know, the, the this kind of you know uh, structural inadequacies and, and issues, and it works to obtain uh, a social change. And and uh, I think this is a very significant because you know majority of social workers. Uh, uh, we most of the social workers uh, we work with the government uh, we collaborate with the government uh, we engage us with the government and uh, uh, those who work with the government and uh, they also have to you know um, follow specific working hours and roles and there are some uh, you know fixed roles and responsibilities you know um, um, for the social workers who engages with the government however the uh, the question here is the is whether social work has the space, will, and scope to engage with the wider structural issues, uh, which affects and which shapes the the lives of you know the life world of citizens in in everyday uh, everyday lives. So these are the uh, questions I would like to to raise uh, here, and these questions are uh, and this surely these questions are addressed by radical social work, and uh, you know when it comes to the theory theoretical you know. Uh, underpinnings and all the radical uh, social work uh, addresses these questions and uh, and it also tells us that you know meaningful uh, you know with meaningful uh, social work practice should always you know uh, contain political involvement so uh, when it comes to social work we uh, social work is very uh, least likely to engage us in, in political actions and the political uh, you know uh, engagements but and and it is a, it, and there there has there has been criticism on the, you know the the a political nature of social work practices uh, across the world especially especially in indian context so and uh, another point i would like to make is that you know state policies in general you know, you know we do have a lot of gen welfare measures policies and a lot of policy measures and and uh, uh, policy prescriptions but uh, Generally, the, the the state policies generally do not acknowledge. You know, there are various structural issues and inadequacies, but uh, state policies generally do not acknowledge this kind of you know structural inadequacies, uh, which also contributes to uh, marginalization of uh, you know 
a num number of uh, citizens. So, uh, in order to maintain an, a social justice and equality, so I believe that social workers should identify these complexities and push for a radical anti-oppressive practice. So, uh, these are the few words I would like to, you know, to setting the agenda. Uh, these are the few words I would like to, um, uh, I mean, I would like to propose. And now, uh, I will just hand over the floor to the, the speaker. And uh, I think uh, after the once uh, the speaker is done with the 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 the, the talk, we will open the floor for a discussion. Possibly, uh, we may take a few questions from the audience. And uh, if, if somebody wants to, you know. Um, ask something they can also post their questions in the chat box and uh, yeah uh, i will uh, i'm handing over the floor to the speaker welcome hello hello yes anish yeah audio yeah 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 professor johnny Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, sir. yes. Sir. All right. Uh, yeah. Thanks, and thanks, Anish, uh, for a wonderful overview of what radical social work is. Uh, and uh, as you uh, will know from my presentation, that what Anish has covered in terms of understanding some of the structural inequities in our societies, one of the most uh, predominant challenges social workers face. And uh, um, before that, uh, and I'm extremely grateful for um, another teacher to invite me uh, to deliver this presentation. And thanks, and it is great to be here with you all uh, today uh, on March 16th. So I just want to uh, uh, begin by stating the mission of social work and then uh, discuss three predominant challenges facing the global community present day that impact social work mission, practice, and the people we serve and resistance and change efforts indicating the need for radical social work practice. Key opportunities for radical social work to contribute to social, economic, and environmental justice and the needs of service users in a world facing multiple crises will be presented as well. The stated mission of the social work profession is to enhance human well being and help meet basic human needs of all people with particular at attention to needs and empowerment of people who are vulnerable, oppressed, and living in poverty. And this is from the National Association of Social Workers. Furthermore, social workers promote social justice and social change with or on behalf of clients, as well as strive to end discrimination, oppression, poverty, and other form of social injustice. So when you look at this uh, stated mission of social work, you know the charge of social workers is to act in unprecedented ways in order to transform the society, in order to eradicate poverty from our society, in order to eliminate all forms of oppression. That's the charge before us. Now, the question is, are we uh, up to that charge? That's the uh, uh, focus point uh, today. So in this presentation, uh, I will attempt to discuss three core issues poverty and global inequality, the rise of fascism all over the world, and war, environmental destruction, and displacement. The first one is poverty and global inequality. Globally, we are witnessing a failed social welfare system fueled by the growing strength of neoliberalism and economic globalization in the 1970s and 80s, resulting in deep cuts in social spending, privatization of social welfare programs, starvation wages, rising deep poverty and income and wealth inequality. The ongoing and profound structural inequities experienced by persons of color communities in the United States and the poor Dalits and tribal communities in India has been amplified by the disproportionate impact of COVID-19. For instance, in regard to poverty, by the very conservative measurement used by IMF, people making less than dollar two or less a day, there are 134 million poor living in India, a 75 million increase from the pre-pandemic total of 59 million. And this is from a Pew Research and Analysis study, which came out in 2021. This accounted for a 60% increase in global poverty in 2021. 
The same study from the Pew Research Center noted that the middle class in India shrunk by 32 million, again accounting for 60 percentage of the drop in global middle class population. Now, who are these poor population? What are their characteristics? In the US, there are around 45 million people living in deep poverty and another 100 million living at or near the poverty threshold. Studies after studies shows that there is disproportionately high rates of poverty among people of color, which includes blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans. And their poverty rate is almost as double as among the white population. In addition, 20% of the children, regardless of their race, live in poverty. In India, according to the National Sample Survey 2015, poverty tend to concentrate among groups who are the most disadvantaged. The tribal communities, the poverty rate among is above 50 percentage. There is around 23 to 26 percentage and groups considered as other backward caste. Their poverty rate is almost around 16 and 20 percentage. A safe, stable, and affordable place to call home is the most essential step in lifting people out of poverty. However, affordable housing is not within the reach of millions of households all over the world. There is ample research evidence to show that homelessness is a policy choice. If adequate affordable housing units are constructed, people are paid livable wages, rents are capped, homelessness can be addressed. However, the reality is incomes are stagnant, Rents are going up every year and less and less affordable houses are being built. According to the National Low Income Housing Coalition in the United States, one must earn a minimum of $22 an hour in order to afford a two bedroom apartment anywhere in the United States. In reality, the federal minimum wage is still $7.25 an hour, which is $15 short of the $22 in order to afford a two bedroom apartment anywhere in the country. There is not a single city in the United States where someone working at the minimum wage can afford housing. As a result, approximately half a million people are experiencing homelessness in a given night in the United States. Around 30 to 40 million people are at the brink of losing their homes because of their current economic circumstances imposed by COVID-19. The irony is that the housing crisis is happening at a time when there are at least five vacant housing units for every homeless individual in the United States. The housing situation is no different in India. According to the 2011 census, there are around 1.7 million homeless in India and a million of those homeless live in urban areas. 18 to 23 million houses in the nation are in immediate need of repair or in dilapidated conditions. COVID-19 has worsened the housing situations of the low income and poor in the country. Housing and Land Rights Network of India in the recent study reported that between 2020 and 2021, at the height of the pandemic, the Indian government forcibly evicted 257,000 households, which is 21 households every hour. Over 16 million households now live under the threat of eviction. This is in spite of various high court directives to state governments to not evict people during a pandemic. The rising cost of healthcare. In the United States, in order to afford healthcare, one has to be either debt poor or has an employment that provides health insurance. Job losses resulting from COVID-19 crisis has caused historic increase in the uninsured population in the country to around 29 million. People of color and families with children have suffered severe healthcare coverage losses resulting in lack of access to preventive services or facing unaffordable medical bills pushing them into medical debt. A 2020 survey by Kaiser Family Foundation identified that 17% of the American household of medical debt. Americans' collective medical debt is somewhere around $195 billion. 16 million people owed somewhere around $1,000, and another 3 million owed more than $10,000 in terms of medical debt. People with 
to that, we'll be forced to reduce the spending on food, clothing, and other household needs. Spend down whatever minimal savings they have in order to pay for medical bills and borrow money from friends or family or loan sharks. A recent World Health Organization report notes that globally, 160 million people, hence, will be forced into poverty because of a medical emergency and ensuing healthcare costs. Oxfam inequality report shows that in India, 63 million Indians will be pushed into poverty every year because of the rising cost of healthcare. Wealth and income inequality. The so-called free market economic system is deliberately structured, or in other words, regulated, to transfer wealth from the workers to the hands of CEOs and shareholders and transferring wealth from poor countries in the South to rich countries in the North, particularly United States and United Kingdom. According to the Economic Policy Institute, in 2020, top CEOs earned 351 times more than a typical worker. CEO pay went up 1,322% since 1978, whereas average worker salary went up by a meager 18%. Every year, Oxfam compiles and publishes the World Inequality Report. In 2021, there were 142 billionaires in India. Their wealth almost doubled from $313 billion in 2020 to $719 billion in 2021, a staggering increase of $400 billion in just one year. While 84% of the Indian population lost their income during the pandemic. Women collectively lost almost $800 billion with 11 million fewer women working as of now. As per the same study, the wealth of global billionaires increased by $5 trillion in just one year from 8.5 trillion to $13.5 trillion, resulting in a massive redistribution of wealth toward the top 1%. It is fascinating that an economic theory developed in the 1770s still guides global economic policies, even though it has no relevance to the real lives and economic conditions of 4 billion ordinary people living in the world at present. We continue those policies because it benefits some. This is a slide that shows the wealth disparity among the top 10% and the bottom 50% of the population in the United States and in India. In both cases, the top 10% owned approximately 70% of the nation's wealth. In the US, it is 70.7%. In India, it is 64.6%. And the bottom 50% of the population has a paltry 3%. 1.5 in the United States and 5.9 in India. And these numbers hold true for world as well and for income inequality as well. This uh, slide shows the net worth of world's top 10 billionaires led by Elon Musk with $210 billion. Their net worth which is $1.283 trillion, is almost double as that of the combined gross domestic product of the world's 36 poorest countries. Most of these countries are in the Sub-Saharan Africa, which were former colonies of the imperialist powers of the world, from which the rich Western countries, even today, extract minerals and natural resources to enrich themselves. What does that mean? A handful of people owning this much wealth, this billionaire class, which uses its income and wealth to rig the political and economic system in their favor, favorable tax rates, tax loopholes, access to cheap credit, land, and labor. And this is what capitalism is all about. Now, what are the consequences of all these? Just a handful of billionaires amassing this much amount of wealth. The most significant impact is the rise of fascism globally. Perhaps you might have noticed this development. If not, it is time to pay attention. 
A wave of right-wing movements developed all across the globe following the 2007 financial crisis in the United States, in Germany, Brazil, Hungary, UK, Philippines, Turkey, and in India. As several scholars indicate, this rise in radical right movements all over the world was an ine inevitable consequence of deep poverty, gross income and wealth inequality, and people's extreme fear of falling into the ranks of poor. As John Bellamy Foster argues, mass mobilization of people behind the right-wing ideology is made possible with the support of monopoly capital, which provides financial support and means of organization for such ideological movements. The movement's political base, which is surprisingly only 20 to 30 percentage of the population, regardless of their geographical location, whether it is in India or US or Brazil, they share some common characteristics. Extreme economic insecurity, fervent nationalism, religious fundamentalism, militant racism, anti-immigrant rhetoric, and xenophobia. In the United States, there is this myth that if you pull up your sleeves and work hard, save enough for your retirement, follow the rules of the free market, one could realize the American dream. The fact of the matter is, regardless of whether you follow the rules of the market system, people's incomes have been stagnant, their cost of living, including housing and healthcare, have been increasing rapidly, and the majority of the Americans have to work two or three full-time jobs to make ends meet. And hence, we got Trump, who was basically a con artist offering the promised land or laying the promised land to the discontented. Since he became president, there has been a concerted effort by him and his allied Republican Party legislators to whitewash American history, erase its racist past, significantly change immigration laws to favor European immigrants, impose travel ban on majority Muslim nations, and derail any social justice movements, including the Black Lives Matter movement. The Trump administration also wanted to infuse patriotic content into education, basically to appease his neo-Nazi right-wing political base, and passed huge tax cuts in 2017 to appease his financial donor base. I'm certain you are pretty much aware of what was happening in India as well. Once came into power, the current administration enacted a series of similar legislations. The Citizenship Amendment Act, which fast-tracked citizenship for everyone except Muslims who arrived in India prior to 2015 from its three majority Muslim neighboring countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. One of the opposition MPs in the Indian parliament said, and I quote, this citizenship law is eerily similar to the Nazi racial laws enacted by Hitler's Germany in the 1930s. Another policy by the current administration, the National Register of Citizens, aimed at creating a citizenship list while at the same time identifying undocumented immigrants in the country. It was first experimented in the northeastern state of Assam in India. Studies shows that there are around 2 million people more than half of whom were Muslims, were rendered stateless once the list was compiled. They will be either deported or kept in the detention centers that's been constructed all across the country. The respective governments in the United States and in India and their response to the ongoing protests against the Black Lives Matters or the water protector movements in the United States and the Citizenship Amendment and the National Registry of Citizens in India were not much different than any other authoritarian regimes in the past and the present. They labeled protesters as terrorists, arrested and imprisoned them without trial, internet blackouts were pretty common, journalists speaking out truth were labeled as anti-national, co-opting national media, the judiciary and the executive, and party supporters instigating riots, targeting religious and racial minorities. The next core issue I would like to discuss is war and uh, displacement. What are the human cause of war? We know for sure that massive resources going into weapons that are dangerous to human survival and perpetuate a state of ongoing war 
that changes place relative to political and political and economic interests of the US empire have destroyed families and communities both domestically and throughout the world. The United States alone spends $778 billion per year on its military budget, which is more than the combined military budgets of the next top nine nations, including Russia, China, India, United Kingdom, and France. US accounts for 39% of the global military budget of $2 trillion. This astronomical spending on defense and allied industries and war has grave consequences, which disproportionately impacts poor people and countries in the global south. It is incredibly difficult to put a value on the lives lost and destructions caused by the endless wars. A study conducted by the Watson Institute at Brown University in the United States reveals some notable findings. The post 9-11 wars resulted in 929,000 deaths, including 387,000 civilians, created 38 million refugees with a price tag close to $8 trillion. Whereas European nations opened their borders and embraced their predominantly white, blonde-haired, blue-eyed 2 million Ukrainian refugees with warmth and love, which is great, the majority of the US and NATO-led post-9-11 war displaced black and brown refugees from Syria, Iraq, Libya, Yemen, Afghanistan, Somalia, are either still living in makeshift camps in their already struggling neighboring countries or died fleeing from violence. It is very well documented the harsh and sometimes fatal conditions these refugees enter when they attempt to reach the shores, borders of the same countries that initiated and perpetuated the global refugee crisis. The impact of global warming on economic inequality is also of particular concern for radical social workers, especially because of its detrimental and disproportionate effect on poor countries and individuals primarily because these countries lack the resources needed to withstand such a crisis. The fossil fuel, chemical, and other industries were responsible for almost 9 million premature deaths globally in 2015. Given the fact that rich countries in the global north are the biggest polluters of the environment, any environmental justice efforts must include reparative measures for the countries that are disproportionately impacted by global warming. These are some of the core challenges that we face at present. And I feel that these crisis moments provide us social workers with enormous opportunities to transform these miserable conditions in ways that benefits the global community and radical social work can play a significant role in that regard. That brings up the question, what is radical social work? Radical social workers are engaged in diverse areas of social work and have been identified by several descriptors, including, for example, radical, structural, feminist, anti-racist, progressive, and critical social workers. Despite differences in visions regarding the best features of future economic political systems, radical social workers share some common values and characteristics. I would like to mention five core values radical social workers possess. First, a belief that the root causes of social and economic problems are based in structural systems, specifically capitalism. And these systems must be transformed into systems that support human rights to resources that meet common human needs and that protect the environment. Second, a belief that all forms of oppression including imperialism, colonialism, racism, sexism, xenophobia, LGBTQI issues, disability, and religious discrimination must be eliminated. Third, a belief that values of extreme individualism, materialism, anti-collectivism, and acceptance of inequality are core tenets of capitalism and are barriers to attaining social, economic, and environmental justice. Fourth, radical social workers have a strong commitment 
to empathy, compassion, and mutual respect, which serves as a guide to working relationships, to democracy, and to social action. And lastly, an innate belief regarding the potential role of social welfare as a possible vehicle towards socialism versus only primarily enabling capitalism. And what are some of the knowledge and skills that we bring to the table? Radical social workers bring a wide range of knowledge and skills to address these values and the current dominant challenges facing the world. Typical social work training includes interventions with individuals, groups, organizations, communities at all levels of governments and international settings using a wide range of micro and micro social work theory and practice knowledge and skills. <clears throat> Excuse me. Radical social workers supplement social work's broad knowledge base with knowledge of structural and radical social work theories and practice intervention strategies, knowledge of current and historical strengths and weaknesses of capitalism, socialism, communism, survival systems of indigenous societies and groups, and knowledge about social welfare systems and programs throughout the world. Radical social workers recognize the practice complexity due to the interaction of economic, political, social, environmental, and personal factors that often require simultaneous actions, including actions related to the struggles of the populations they are serving, finding or developing alternative ways and resources to meet immediate critical needs of the population, and engagement in social action to change the oppressive institutions that generate these conditions. And some of the intervention strategies that radical social workers adopt are listed in here. First and most importantly, radical social workers advocate the change in meaning of social justice, as it is state, stated in the social work mission statement to political, social, economic, racial, and environmental justice, targeting local, national, and international issues, and major protests focused on multiple critical issues with emphasis on root causes of social and individual problems, in addition to calling out capitalism and its failures. Radical social workers also collaborate with the individuals and organizations that are working to raise personal and political consciousness based on the principles of Paulo Freire and create international collaborations to share knowledge concerning policy, economic and social programs that meet common human need and protect the environment. One positive outcome of the COVID-19 crisis that fits perfectly with the radical social workers' key goals has been the rejuvenations of community action based on collectivism, mutual support, sharing resources, as well as strengthening community solidarity, led and supported by people of all ages, race, nationality, and gender identity. Community level action has included the creative merger of art, music, cultural knowledge, and religious beliefs as components of community building. These efforts have the potential of increasing the sense of common cause and reinforcing social democratic values of freedom, collectivism, equality, humanitarianism, and democratic participation versus the neoliberal values of consumerism, strong individualism, modified democracy influenced by big money interest and process that keeps control in the upper class and inequality. An increasing number of radical social workers dedicated to economic transformation have joined radical economists, radical criminologists, and others in pursuing projects and actions supporting the social and solidarity economy movement. Emily Kawano describes the essence of this movement. The social and solidarity economy seeks to transform the dominant capitalist system as well as other authoritarian state dominated systems into one that puts people and the planet at its core. This transformation is understood to include our economic as well as social and political systems 
as they are inextricably intertwined. Social and solidarity economy projects in the United States provides survival resources to people struggling to meet basic needs and include many food projects such as farm cooperative societies, urban farming and collective housing projects, worker owned cooperations and growing number of areas of development. Envisioning a social and solidarity economy model of economic development for cities versus the wealth and profit driven growth and trickle down model, including gentrification, which is so destructive to people and the planet could provide a strong transformative framework for social work action. What I feel is that this is what we are witnessing uh, the present day is the crisis of capitalism. COVID-19 crisis has given us an opportunity to look deep into the darkness of the ongoing systemic inequities and sufferings people of color and poor and low income countries have been facing for decades, if not centuries, because of a seriously flawed economic system. Not only that capitalism didn't protect, protect us during this pandemic, it has been creating miseries and sufferings for millions of people all over the world for centuries. In this pandemic, 6 million people died. 500 million people were infected with COVID. Millions forcibly evicted from their homes. Billions struggled to pay for their healthcare expenses or to get vaccines. Many millions didn't have any safety net or resources to fall back on and had to continue working without any protective equipment and in spite of increased health risks, all at a time when the global billionaire class grew their wealth by a whopping $5 trillion. The challenge before us is to strive toward an economic system, an economic model that puts people and planet before greed and exploitation, that guarantees economic security in terms of a livable wage, an economic model that ensure housing and healthcare as a human right. And I personally feel that radical social work theory and practice provides us with the knowledge and resources while we work with and on behalf of our service users to meet those goals. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Johnny, for your uh, stimulating uh, discussion on the, uh, the social, economic, and uh, uh, environmental justice through radical social work. And uh, uh -huh. I think, uh, should I, should I, should I, should I summarize the uh, the, uh, the 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 lecture, or um, sh should we shall we directly go to the discussion? At Hello. It's a, it's up to you. We have uh, plenty of time. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Anish, uh, better yeah. you summarize and then when we then we go in for the discussion. Okay, all right, all right, all right. Okay, okay, okay. Professor Joni started with the uh, you know because he has just mentioned uh, mentioned about you know the uh, the the uh, the the social uh, radical social work you know the the state, stating by stating the mission of radical social works, and uh, he also uh, pointed that you know uh, so councils like in NSW and very explicitly. Uh, very explicitly, you know, uh, when it comes to these councils, and you know, I think what I feel that you know, because uh, most of the council, uh, be it from the council from Canada or uh, Australia, or especially from the West, you know, uh, they they very explicitly endorse you know the social justice and you know equality in their, uh, in their in their uh, agenda, what what we call the mission. But uh, we but uh, we hardly see any such you know kind of endorsement. Uh, uh, when it comes to the countries like India, we do also have you know uh, different forums of so social workers, uh, professional social workers, and uh, activists. But we we hardly see any any such you know kind of endorsement in 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 in, in professional bodies. And you know we we just uh, you know um, uh, most of the time we we are very most unlikely to you know um, acknowledge this, this sort of radical uh, the social structural issues. And you know we we are very hesitant to in the, at, at the at least even uh, we don't even acknowledge these sort of uh, different structural uh, uh, issues and uh, uh, professor joni also also mentioned about you know the rising uh, the, the global inequality and uh, the poverty 
so and uh, he also problematized the, the the estimation of poverty uh, poverty and uh, the, and who constitute the poor and and we uh, we 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 uh, came to know that you know uh, the most of the uh, people who is uh, the race race array uh, people who constitute uh, the the minorities uh, ethnic groups minority ethnic groups and racial groups they are most likely to be affected by the uh, by the global widening of global inequality and the, the rising of poverty and uh, um when it comes to the housing and you know the we, we know that if you already know that you know most of the cities are you know are flooded with a uh, and there is a population explosion in the most of the the cities and uh, and the metropolis and uh, we see that there is also a crisis for you know for providing uh, you know in in availing the housing uh, for especially for the low socio economic uh, groups and the pace of urbanization uh, i think uh, that will aggravate the situation current situation and then if the pace continue to uh, to uh, to 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 grow and it um and uh, the it will aggravate the situation and you know there will be um, more people uh, uh, will be struggling to find uh, the proper housing and uh, um, accommodation facilities in, uh, in the develop both the developing countries and the developed countries and uh, uh, then we, uh, we we when we look at the rising cost of healthcare and that is also a pressing issue for us and uh, and there is also a transaction we also do have a lot of government wel welfare policies a lot of health programs uh, government also provide free healthcare facilities for the citizens but there is a transaction cost to you know to access those um, healthcare facilities and and i always wonder when our students go to the field and you know when they come back and if they would complain that you know uh, sir there are people there are lot of poly programs but people hardly uh go to the, the institute to avail these programs and uh, i always wonder what but uh, they our students uh, i'm not blaming them but but we hardly acknowledge you know the structure in uh, uh, structural issues like you know a person uh, for availing the, the healthcare to access the healthcare facility the person has to go to the the facility but and there is a cost involved in the accessing the facility we generally we don't uh, acknowledge recognize this transaction cost it is invisible transaction cost cost is in this uh, especially uh, when it comes to the healthcare in 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 our context and the uh, kerala when it comes to the the out of pocket expenses in, in healthcare we are also uh, especially kerala out of uh, pocket expense is very high uh, compared to other other states and that is also a concern for us possibly we may we may initiate a discussion on this on this and uh, uh, and he also uh, professor johnny also uh, mentioned about you know the the global political economy and the how it shapes the, uh, the the how it also contribute to the the widening of uh, wealth inequality and uh, and other uh, other related issues and you know and there is an underlying belief that you know uh, in especially in economic theories and you know development practices there is an underlying belief that the trickle down when uh, where, wherever you know somebody uh, you know proposes a uh, big projects and you know and there is a logic and they give a logic that you know that, that will goes to the or reaches to the poor you know those who, is, who are living in the bottom and the, the belief and it is we uh technically we say that you know i think it's trickle down it that will uh, go to the the bottom but it has also proven that you know proven to be ineffective in fighting in the rising poverty and inequality and uh, and it is very evident and it is very evident that trickle down uh, has miserably failed to address the rising inequality and the and the poverty and the uh, and we also see the the rise of right wing tendencies in especially in the and europe europe and you know um uh, in the western countries and you know we also see the rise of right wing in india as well and uh, and uh, along with the the state surveillance state also have you know uh, they increased their grip on the citizens uh, by implementing various surveillance strategies and uh, and the policies and we also see the the see the for the last uh, last two decades we also see the uh, we have also witnessed the the increasing number of you know you know um no not uh, no war not only war but uh, we also see some kind of in you know, the power crisis and the power um um uh, some kind of struggles for power in in, in global um, geopolitically also we also witness and uh, we we have uh, already seen that the war on terror you know um, especially uh, by the american policy war on terror 
has actually uh, created a large number of refugees across um, Asia and the uh, especially Asian Asian continent. So a lot of people have been displaced and a lot of people rendered harmless and in the, the Middle East and uh, in the South Asian countries. For 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 instance, Iraq, Afghanistan, and and this uh, this uh, the mounting number of refugees. Uh, is also a concern for uh, for the social work, not only social work for the uh, for all the humanitarian um, workers and you know policy makers. It is also a large large concern. And uh, another thing is the climate change. Climate change is also also getting uh, getting you know attention among the social workers and you know because uh, earlier people were very uh, very hesitantly you know uh, people uh, were not uh, very much you know um, in engaging in the in the and the environmental issues and all but now there is a we people are coming up with and you know because there are um, and there are movements and there are social movements and there are we see a lot of a uh, lot of people engaging with this all uh, this uh, movements to bring environmental justice and you know uh, redistribution of uh, so environmental resources and uh, uh, towards the end uh, professor johnny um uh, in, uh, Mentioned about you know the radical uh, radical social work. What does it mean by so radical social work? The underlying um, assumption of ra radical social work, and you know, uh, as far as I understood, you know, the, all the you know it it, uh, it calls for ending all forms of oppression. Radical so social worker just not you know um, work among the people, and you know they 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 always want to you know um, end all forms of oppression uh, you know across the world. Know, this uh, respective for gender ethnicity and you know uh, religious identities so and uh, and there is a he also uh, in pointed the interventions in you know, what kind of intervention they do and we also and the literature shows that you know there is there are there are different models uh, especially if I'm, if we look into the look into the, the context of you know latin america and uh, the the people of latin america they have actually uh, carried forward the uh, the ideas of paulo freire and you know the the uh, and they constant try to constantize and uh, politicize the the citizens and the and um, they are uh, these countries and most of the uh, the latin american countries they have already uh, demonstrated that you know the state policies can can uh, put you know post uh, you know uh, take care of the welfare of and you know, the well-being of the uh, the citizens and uh, these were the to summarize these were the i think uh, i have uh, covered all the all the themes uh, you know um, uh, i think i think we may open the floor for a discussion to us uh, all uh, you know uh, we, we may take a few cup uh, questions uh, if if uh, in case of uh, you know uh, i think i'm i'm on the phone smartphone i can i cannot see, i'm not able to see the the chat box here so um, if uh, there are there are questions in the chat box yeah. and i i would um, you know this organizes kindly you know um, anyway the, you can also ask the questions and if somebody wants to ask there are, in, uh, anish there are questions yeah. in the chat box yeah 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 let me let me see have... let me see i can okay. uh, i don't know fine let me see yeah thank you Uh, could you possibly uh, forward the uh, the chat to uh, Professor Johnny? I, I'm not able to see. I don't know. Uh, let me see. Yeah. I think our my coordinator can read. Let, let me. Let me. Yeah, yeah. I can see. I can see. I can see. I can see. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, Krishna Jayantana uh, he asking as you told about the Professor Johnny. Are you are you able to? Are you listening? Hello. I'm listening. I'm listening. Okay, 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 okay. I will just read out, uh, read out the question. Okay, as you told about the concept uh, radical social work, I want to know if there are any connection to the concept uh, like socialism. He was, uh, he was wondering if there is any, if he could, uh, you know, find any connection between the socialism and uh, radical social work. Yeah. Well, that's a great question, uh, and thanks so much for asking that, uh, uh, and which is again highly relevant. And, uh, you know, as I discussed in my presentation, radical social work is a possible vehicle towards attaining socialism. You know, if you look at, uh, you know, so socialism is very uh, loosely defined uh, by people. You know, sometimes people say that Russia is a socialist country. 
uh, how do you defend how do you say that russia is a socialist country russia is not a socialist country it's, it's, it is an authoritarian nation china it is an authoritarian nation that's not socialism so socialism is always loosely defined but the socialism uh, in 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 academic terms or in intellectual terms uh, what we are visioning in society where workers own all the means of production that's the ultimate goal of socialism workers they own uh, the means of uh, production and the fruits of their production and then they distribute their profits among themselves to their uh, well-being as well as the well-being of the or the greater good uh, for the society now that being said radical social work the values that we have uh, you know in terms of cooperation mutuality sharing of resources eliminating all forms of oppression that aligns perfectly well with the goals of uh, uh, true socialism so in that way i would say yes uh, radical social work uh, is a, a, a possible vehicle towards attaining uh, the goal of socialism yeah thank you thank you thank you professor and uh, another question is from uh, hhdn uh, i don't know who is uh, i don't know i don't know i don't recognize uh, okay 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 and and uh, is asking the person is asking uh, sir in india can uh, we can see the right wing political parties are manipulating the people according to their agenda in this scenario how can we practice radical social work from the grassroots level Yeah. Can you Hello? ask that question one more time, please? Yeah, 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 sir. Sir, in India, we can see the right, right political parties are manipulating the people according to their agenda. In this scenario, how can we practice radical social work from the grassroots level? Well, you know, that's not a situation unique to India. It's it's unique to uh, uh, all over the world. you know and that's the reason why we are seeing the the rise of fascist movements all across the uh, globe in the united states we received trump uh, in brazil they have jay bolsonaro in hungary they have orban in turkey they have erdogan so all over the world uh, people are uh, the people in power they are manipulating uh, the public now that being said Uh, you know the goal of radical social work is to uh, create uh, awareness and political consciousness among people and this could be done through uh, mutual aid networks small groups uh, of people uh, regardless of the settings that you are working in if you are working in the uh, prison setting if you are working in a um, child welfare setting if you are working in a homeless shelter there are ways that you could bring in people together uh, share their uh, experiences share their uh, struggle their survival uh, efforts and then inform them you know it's it's not your responsibility to inform them it is your responsibility to facilitate that conversation share resources so that people are informed and they take charge of their situation and that could be done in smaller group settings uh, uh, regardless of the setting that you are uh, working on thank you and uh, another question can you sir can you mention about the current roles of a radical criminologist in radical social work practice and this is the first time i'm 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 hearing something like radical criminologist yeah 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 the current roles of a radical criminologist in a radical social work practice that's an excellent question uh, uh, to be honest uh, you know social workers don't even uh, do a great job of working with the prison population and when we did a um, research uh, back in 2017 2018 about uh, transforming the criminal justice system in the united states we came across critical criminologists i mean they go by different names radical criminologists critical criminologists you know they are the ones at the forefront of transforming the criminal justice system in the united states and in other western countries now what differentiates the the critical criminologists or the radical criminologists from others you know one thing that they advocate is that they uh, they push for uh, completely dismantling the criminal justice system uh, how are they going to accomplish that primarily investing in the root causes of crime you know we all know that uh, what are the major issues of crime what are the major causes of crime uh, poverty poverty is one of the major uh, reasons for crime uh sociologist uh, criminologists social workers have studied and they found out that uh, poverty is one of the major reasons for crime but still we don't invest in uh, eradicating poverty anywhere in the world 
so the critical criminologists their ultimate goal is to invest in communities invest in healthcare invest in building infrastructure invest in creating leisure activities for people invest in creating employment opportunities for people so that people don't um, resort to you know illegal activities in order to uh, bring in money uh, you know it's 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 fascinating um, and i'm glad that this question was raised because uh, you know in in my presentation i discussed how much uh, a person working on a minimum wage uh, makes uh, every hour uh, it's $7.25 so if you work 40 hours a week and 160 hours a month they would be making around 1200 dollars a month and that's not enough to make to afford a single bedroom apartment in any city anywhere in the united states so people don't have any money to do that whereas at the same time if they sell a gram of uh, cocaine or a gram of uh, cannabis they would be making that much money uh, within uh, an hour or within a single transaction so there is ample reason for them to resort to such illegal activities than working on a federal minimum wage of $7.25. So the critical criminologists and allied, <coughs> excuse me, social workers, what our goal is to uh, uh, push the government, uh, advocate for more investment in creating better infrastructure better employment opportunities, better resources for people so that they don't have to resort this, to these illegal activities. And yet another thing that uh, the critical criminologists and radical social workers uh, advocate is to reduce the prison population. You know, in the United States is the uh, prison capital of the world. We have around 2.1 million people uh, in our uh, state federal and um, uh, state federal prisons and local jails uh, in, the, in the counties. 2.1 million people. That's more than the prison population of India, China, Russia combined. So, so, and who are these people in the prison? They are the people who have been arrested for minor uh, uh, drug possessions. Like if someone possesses or sell a gram of uh, uh, cannabis, they're arrested and sentenced to prison for almost 10, 15, 20 years. Extremely long sentences. So when I tell my students, uh, you know, the life sentence in India is around 10 to 12 uh, years. I think it is 12 years in India. Uh, correct me if I am wrong. The life sentence in the United States is literally life you know you are in prison for your entire life you will not get out you will not get even you will not even get parole and that's why we have this huge prison population so we advocate in order to reduce the prison population by reducing uh, this mandatory sentencing from 15 20 years to maybe three uh, three to four months or not even sentencing them instead of providing instead of sentencing people to prison giving give them the opportunities or resources to uh, uh, make a better living that's the critical criminologists or the radical criminologists and the social workers, radical social workers are advocating for. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Professor. Uh, actually, uh, what I'm seeing here is that, you know, actually the chat box, you know, uh, the, the, it's nice, nice to see that, you know, our students are, you know, I think part, mostly participants. They're actually bombarding the chat box with the questions, right? with, with a lot of questions. That's, that's great. I mean, it's better yeah, to yeah, have more yeah. questions than that. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So actually, our students are you know, bombarding, actually. The uh, <coughs> chat box is full, uh, if that's it. Uh, and uh, STN, uh, yeah. So, Akhil Raj. Akhil Raj, I ask him, uh, what differentiate radical social work from Marxist social work? Well, Actually, the radical social work uh, will I uh, 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 rely so much on Marxist uh, uh, feminist theories and uh, in its uh, strictest sense. Many of the progressive social work theories, uh, radical social work, critical social work, anti-oppressive practice, feminist social work practice, structural social work practice, all these uh, uh, professional practice, uh, social work practice borrows heavily from Marxist uh, uh, theories. And I would say that it's basically uh, a Marxist um, philosophy and uh, principles that underlies radical, radical social work practice. Question from SDN. Sir, can you explain the professional aspects in RSW, radical social work? Professional aspects in radical social work. Mm -hmm. what does can, you explain, uh, can you explain the professional aspects in radical social work? That is a question. I, I don't know. Uh, I think. 
uh, i hope i am understanding the uh, 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 question correctly uh, professional aspect means in terms of the employment opportunities or ethics or uh, what uh, hdn can could you possibly uh, explain it more and uh, you know uh, it is not uh, you know it is not very explicit in the your question could you possibly uh, retype or you know re restructure the question sd uh, yeah so akhil raj, sir akhil raj uh, sir what differentiate radical social work uh, sorry if you answered it okay um, i mean if i understood that there is another okay. question uh, in, in, before in terms that of i think aspect of radical social work i mean the goals and the uh, the knowledge base you know what we believe uh, the radical social workers believe is that the root causes of uh, uh, the problems must be addressed and that's the most important part and in social work we tend to go with the psychological theories uh, that help people adapt uh, cope with the environment I mean that's important. We don't uh, discount the need to help people adapt to the environment. That's important. But at the same time, that doesn't address the root causes of the problem. So in radical social work, uh, one, the core focus is on addressing the root causes of the problem, and which we believe lies in the uh, the economic system that we have uh, uh, in the world, the free market economic system that tend to favor the rich. You know, otherwise, just look at what is going on, what is unfolding right in in front of our eyes. You know, the COVID nineteen pandemic. no it basically help us to realize that these structural inequalities have been going for long but we never realized that but covid 19 help us realize that you know 1 million uh, people died uh, in the united states alone the richest country on planet earth 1 million people died almost uh, 6 million uh, infected with covid the richest country on planet earth uh, how how does that happen I mean, that's that's a sad situation so the reason the, the reason for that is happening is you know the uh, as i showed in one of the slides the bottom half of the population 50 percentage of the population they have 1.5 percentage of the total uh, wealth and total income they are just struggling working on two three jobs uh, to make ends meet and uh, and we believe that you know social work need to address you know people's immediate critical needs while at the same time address the root causes of the social problem whether it is crime uh, whether it is poverty whether it is housing whether it is healthcare uh, we have to look into the root causes yeah yeah thank you uh, and jeevan uh, was asking uh, as, as you as you mentioned radical social work is a vehicle to socialism uh, what kind of socialism do you propose for the future uh, what kind of change can eliminate the class structure how can workers own uh, of take over the means of production in current situation how can we democratize workplace so that seems okay. like a, a long question uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. A, that is that is a great question i mean it's a yeah. uh, it's it will not happen overnight because we know that how powerful uh, the current free market model is because it benefits the uh, richest uh, uh, on on planet earth now there are there are examples numerous examples uh, of cooperative movements happening all across the world and one of the model that i suggested uh, and which um, uh, i co-authored a paper with two of my colleagues and which is available at the united nations uh, website uh, talk about the social and solidarity economy movement and the primary purpose of that movement is to uh to create uh, resources for people to meet their basic human need like food clothing and shelter uh without uh, any regard for making any profits out of that uh, endeavor and simultaneously respecting the planet uh, you know we don't want to uh, exploit the planet uh, its natural resources which of course is uh, causing um, global warming um, uh, which again have disproportionate impact on poor and low income countries uh so the social and solidarity economy movement uh, which primarily brings together people organizations together work together uh, generate resources in order to meet critical human needs and this originated in latin america i mean of course latin america is always the uh, uh the ground for activism and uh, uh, socialism and this originated actually from brazil this uh, social and solidarity economy movement and we have numerous examples in india too the the uh, 
what was that the the milma uh, dairy product uh, which is based in surat gujarat it's a cooperative society which is built on social and solidarity economy principles we have so many cooperative societies uh, in in kerala uh, the self help group movement what exactly is that you have how many self help groups the the kudumbasri or the similar projects in kerala that where people come together uh mobilize money and resources in order to address their immediate uh, needs there are uh, so many such products going on in there in the us we have uh, uh, community gardening uh, um, we have some in the port cities where i li- uh, where i live it's nothing they a group of people or a community they come together and then they lease land from the government the government provide the resources and social workers provide these uh, uh, folks with uh, support uh, and resources to uh, uh, do the community gardening and all the members share the profit uh, share the uh, fruits uh, of their community garden and they sustain they maintain that community garden so the beauty of these projects are they are localized they take care of the needs of the local population without destroying the environment and following ethical principles and practice and i believe that could be that could be possible you know this last january i had the opportunity to travel to the central northern part of india visiting some of the indigenous communities you know struggling uh, uh, in living in deep poverty in one of the organizations uh, that we travel with they do an amazing work in some of these indigenous communities what they do is they bring together 120 130 uh, tribal households provide them with the resources to do organic farming and then help them uh, with seeds um, organic fertilizers and then uh, ultimately harvest their crops which provides a minimal which provides essential nutritious food for their community which is an amazing work these are the things that could be undertaken at uh, uh, local level by uh, local non profit organizations and social work uh, uh, groups i hope i answered your question uh excuse me sir i think there's a question which you might have missed uh, the question was raised by akhil raj and it goes like this sir when we look over the ukraine russia war friend issues there was a quote by the ukraine deputy prosecutor that europeans with blue eyes and blonde hair were killed daily how we could overcome this type of mentality of the people even from europe where social work practices are more effectively practiced Oh, I missed the quote. What, what was the U- Ukrainian prosecutor said? Uh, can you just say that Europeans again? Europeans with blue eyes and blonde hair were killed daily. Uh huh. Well, you know that uh, uh, shows us the crisis that we face. It's <clears throat> I think uh, some of the uh, social work radical social work uh, practitioners they have highlighted this, or uh, sociologists, the sociologists they highlighted this. what we have is not a refugee crisis what we have is a racism crisis uh you know uh, we know that the way media covers these instances you know if you look at uh, the mainstream media uh, especially the western media like the guardian or the new york times or washington post the way they cover uh, the ukrainian refugee crisis you know i mean it's it's great i mean i i would say that it should be covered uh what i would say is that the at the same uh, fervor they should cover the refugee crisis in afghanistan the refugee crisis in somalia the refugee crisis in syria and uh, other parts of the world but that's not happening so it's actually a racism crisis which we all know exists in our country i mean it's it's a uh, it's a sad situation and how do we do that so how do we address that i mean we have to call them out i mean that's the role of radical social workers that's the role of uh, any progressive social social workers or any progressive individual interested in transforming uh, our social system we have to call them out name them out and start the conversation i mean this is what uh, should be done and that's the beginning step and uh, again it's a much larger issue uh, uh, which needs attention yeah there is uh, there is another questions from a uh, question from uh, akhi uh, and the radical social work aims to improve oppressed people's lives on this grounds please share your ideas on how the structural change is possible in current social economic and environmental uh, justice in india as a developing country uh, i will read it once again the radical social work aims to improve 
oppressed people's lives on these grounds please share your ideas on how the structural changes change is possible in current socio economic and environmental uh, current socio economic and environmental justice in india as a development developing country great question i mean what i would recommend is that you know first of all we have to uh, put planet and people first before greed and profit excuse me exploitation of the environment i we know that i mean if you look at some of the policies of the current administration not just current administration previous administrations as well in terms of leasing out lands for uh, fossil fuel industries it's it's stunning it's alarming i mean that's going to uh, wreak havoc in the environment i mean that has to be stopped and how do we stop that i mean there are numerous protest movements happening all across the country uh, everywhere uh following uh the the two major uh, citizenship law uh, passed by the uh, federal government central government you know there was a huge uh, uh, protest movement uh, in shaheen bag the women of uh, the the, de- the daddies of shaheen bag protest uh, you know if you uh, uh, i don't know whether you are familiar with it uh, the karwan e mohabbat uh, campaign by harsh mandal is a classic example of how you can mobilize people uh, in terms of a larger community interest to dismantle uh, some of the uh, uh, oppressive structures in our community that's at the national level now at the local level i would always prefer you to go at the local level which is uh, easier to do rather than you know uh, uh, going for a massive uh, uh, larger protest movement which is also important the, at the local level just the example that i shared when i traveled with uh, uh, one uh, non profit organization in north and central india uh, a tribal community cannot have access to any land uh, basically they are dispossessed of land in fact the land belong to them but they don't have any legal rights to that land this group they want these people to claim rights to their land and actually help them cultivate that that land Uh, and then generate resources to meet uh, the needs of that community uh, you know one of the tribal communities that we visited uh, there were around uh, uh, 300 households uh, they might make around 3000 5000 rupees a year and you know that that's not enough to uh, uh, survive um, in in india but this group helped this uh, uh, 300 households to cultivate 3 3 1/2 3 acres of land per each household organic farming provide them with the seeds and then provide with the org- provide them with the knowledge uh, to cultivate um, provide them with the irrigation uh, they created a check dam so that they have water resources to uh, irrigate their land which resulted in bumper crops for them for the last 2 uh, 3 years they did what the work they did was very minimal work but organizing the people providing them with the resources they need to develop their land and cultivate their land which provided essential food for that community i mean this could be done at, at different levels uh, all across the country uh, and that's related to livelihood now um, other oppressive conditions uh, violence child welfare needs uh, it's it's all about working with local communities non profit organizations they are uh, who are working together sitting collaborate with them identify their mutual interests and then facilitate their mutual interest uh, to a shared goal i hope i answered your question yeah yeah thank you uh, see, sir we we do have uh, two more questions would you mind taking this uh, two questions of course yes yeah yeah thank you thank you uh, sigil sigil was asking india has changed a lot there has been an economic and healthcare inequality the country is moving on in this social situation how can we or through what kind of strategies can reduce economic and health care inequality among citizens oh well, that's a big question i mean the health care inequality the only way to address health care inequality is to provide universal health care access to free health care for all the citizens now how is that possible even in the richest country uh, on planet earth uh, united states we don't have that we don't have universal health care do we have the resources to provide universal health care yes we do we have the resources to provide universal health care and uh, you know and united states is a country that provides uh, that spends per capita around uh, 15000 us dollars per capita per year on health care 
And in spite, we don't have the best health indicators of the world. I want to give you one example, uh, which is uh, Cuba. Uh, I'm sure you are familiar with Cuba, which is a, a communist country uh, led by uh, or ruled by a dictator, Fidel Castro, for almost 50, 60 years. However, that country has universal health care. Cuba is a country of around 11, 12 million people. Those 12 million people, they have free access to health care. So it is possible to access, to provide free health care, universal health care to all human beings in a nation. Now, what are the outcomes of providing uh, universal health care? Again, citing Cuba as an example, the life expectancy of people in Cuba, it's almost 83 years. Anyone, any individual born right now in Cuba is expected to live for 83 years. That's, a, that's better than the life expectancy in the United States, which is around 79 uh, years uh, for the population. In fact, the life expectancy in the United States went down this year and previous year, the first time in its history. Whereas a Cuban uh, uh, nation, which is subjected to the US economic embargo for the past 50 years, uh, is able to provide universal health care for all its citizens, increase in life expectancy, reducing infant mortality rate. The infant mortality rate at another indicator of uh, uh, global health or health index. In Cuba, it is four per thousand live births. In the United States, that is six. Uh, so we're worse than that in Cuba. So it is possible that universal healthcare can be provided and improve life situations uh, of uh, people. Now, how is that possible in India? Well, uh, World Health Organization recently published a study which shows that you know, India has to spend an upwards of 55 to 60 percentage in order to meet the healthcare needs of its population, and especially after the pandemic. So we need to prioritize uh, our, uh, our, our goals, our objectives. Uh, instead of spending on uh, military, instead of spending on uh, you know, uh, other uh, projects, uh, maybe we should prioritize the needs of its citizens and provide universal uh, healthcare. A great example is Kerala. You, know, you live in Kerala, uh, the life expectancy of the Kerala uh, population is around 17, 78, 79 years, which is comparable with that of the Western world. Infant mortality rate, somewhere around four or five, which is again comparable with the Western world. How is that possible? Because we have a, a, a healthcare system which is accessible, at least the primary healthcare system that we have, the PHC centers, the community health centers, the medical colleges that we have, that are accessible, accessible to the population. Uh, that makes uh, that uh, such a great life expectancy possible in India. So this could be modeled for the rest of India as well. I mean, I don't know why, why, what is keeping us from doing that. Uh, that should be the priority and that should be the advocacy uh, efforts social work should focus our attention on, providing universal health care for all its people in our country. And we, 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 can, we can do that. If Cuba could do that, we could do that. And I also want to highlight one interesting thing about Cuba. Uh, I don't know how many of you know, Cuba is the one country on planet Earth that vaccinated all of its citizens, almost 98, 99 percentage of its citizens with indigenously made vaccines. They made it all by themselves, five uh, different forms of vaccines. And they vaccinated all the population above two years of age uh, by uh, the end of uh, 2021. And then only this uh, opened their schools and businesses. Can you imagine that? So even in the United States, the vaccination rate is around 66, 67 percentage. And you know that some countries in the world, uh, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, you know, their vaccination rate is 13, 14 percentage. And Cuba, uh, they even promise their vaccines free of cost, uh, which again, historically they do that. You know, they send their doctors to other parts of the world. In fact, when COVID broke out, uh, they were the first ones to send uh, their doctors and nurses to Italy to take care of the COVID infected uh, uh, people in their nursing homes. So they did an amazing job, which again, if a country with less resource can provide universal health care for its people, I think India could do that. But for that, we need to prioritize our goals. We need to prioritize our values. Do we care for our people or we care for other stuff? 
so we have a uh, i think this is this would be the last question and uh, sdn was asking how can we practice radical social work in nations that are influenced by extreme right wing ideologies and what will be the major challenges and how can we overcome that well uh, the first and most important thing again the united states we have the extreme right wing ideology right in front uh, 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 in front of us and we might even ex uh, experience that in future as well because that's the disenchantment people have about uh, the both parties that we have in this country so how do we address that i mean it's political consciousness uh, people have to be educated Uh, that's the most important part. Uh, uh, we have to educate people about our oppressive economic system, the free market system that we have. No one is benefiting out of it. I mean, people are benefiting. I mean, the extreme rich, uh, they are benefiting out of this economic system. But uh, the rest of us are not. Uh, you know, in, in the U.S., we have only two options, either vote for Republican or for a Democrat. And for us, they both are the same. these two political parties they embrace the same free market principle and we know that the same free market principle are the ones uh, perpetuating this uh, economic crisis all over the world i mean this is not sustainable this is not sustainable if you remember the graph that i showed you in terms of uh, income and wealth inequality it's widening its gross income inequality and as long as those economic inequality persists people will be dis discontented and they will uh, you know vote for anything that uh, you know uh, anything anti immigrant xenophobic uh, 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 rhetoric ideology it's very easy to manipulate people in such a movement so what we need to do is first raise political consciousness what social work schools can do i don't know how many of you have uh, learned about radical social work uh, in your curriculum maybe it, it's time that we include radical social work uh, practice its values its principles its strategies in social work curriculum maybe it's time for social work to address the root causes of the problem rather than you know spending our enormous time and effort in helping people adapt to the environment now if you look at that strategy helping people cope with the environment you would see that that's kind of perpetuating the status quo do we want to do that uh well that's a question i am going to pose in front of you do we want to continue the status quo or we want to transform the system if we want to transform the system we need to address the root causes of the problem i mean that's challenging the economic system which is most important i mean the economic system uh, we have the poverty that we have uh, you know the people's uh, uh, perilous situation that we are seeing it's very easy to manipulate them to something like a right wing ideological movement i mean in order to challenge that uh, people's economic conditions has to be improved and for that raising consciousness paulo freire's uh, theories and principles calls immense value yeah yeah i, I think we are done with the questions i think uh, yeah i think it's time to you know wind up the session and uh, uh, thank you professor johnny for uh, for coming and you know uh, giving the, such a stimulating you know uh, engaging uh, discussion on the uh, radical social work and i also appreciate uh, the part the participants and uh, they made it very you know very uh, lovely and you know happening you know uh, memorable session and i think uh, now it's over to you and uh, i think uh, yeah i just want to say a few words i mean um, i mean it's great that you know my alma mater my, my co colleagues my uh, friends are is are uh, uh, raising a group of uh, uh, kids of uh, students uh, that are uh, politically conscious and asking these stimulating questions i really appreciate the teachers doing uh, that phenomenal job and and it was a great pleasure being with my alma mater and i really appreciate inviting me Thank you, sir, and thank you all for actively participating in the discussion. There's a gentle reminder to all the participants: please do fill up the feedback forms shared in the chat box. And now I request Ms. Shruti Chandran to express our gratitude. Good evening to everyone present here. Honorable Chief Guest of the session, Dr. Joni Agustin. Professor Saint Ambrose University, Iowa, USA; Dr. Anida A, teacher in charge, Department of Social Work, and all faculties of Department of Social Work, and other valuable participants. 
it's a privilege for me to get the opportunity to deliver the word of thanks on behalf of the department of social work sri shankaracharya university of sanskrit regional center by we extend sincere gratitude to our keynote speaker dr joni agastin extremely happy to have your presence for this conference and share your knowledgeable session on the theme social economic and environmental justice through radical social work opportunities and challenges we express our sincere gratitude our moderator of this session ms ranish k assistant professor department of social work sri shankaracharya university of sanskrit regional center turavu thank you for being with us we owe our gratitude to all faculties research scholars students of different universities and colleges who have been throughout this session i thank ms anashwara for the welcome address thank you all for your all for participation thank you have a great night thank you let us all be guided by all the things we learned and heard throughout the session and be able to see and influence our future we wind up the session here please do join us for our upcoming thematic presentations and paper presentations beginning at 10 am tomorrow thank you uh, that was an excellent uh, session john we are very delighted and thank you anish both our alumni we are very proud and yeah uh, thank you thank said, you teacher <laughs> <laughs> i think uh, our students yeah, did a great you. job too thank you thank you very much I'm glad you enjoyed. Yes, yes. I really enjoyed the session, Professor. I really enjoyed the session, and at least I learned many things from you. And you're an excellent teacher, you know. Ah, uh, and you too took time to at least you know answer the queries of from the participants. Thanks, thanks for. I hope I answered their questions. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. You know, I was saying that you know you are a great teacher, you know, because you know you are an inspiring teacher. Yeah, I, I wish it was more in person rather than this. Uh, yeah. You know, it's technology. I I, I was telling Anita that you know I I hate delivering a lecture.